Good morning. Well, it's a nice looking crowd today. Looks like it's going to be a lot prettier day. I was hoping that that snow we got earlier this week will be our last blast of winter for the season because I'm ready for spring. Well, enjoying our time getting to be with you and, and uh, be, you know, be with you throughout this month of March and uh, then our time will be over with and uh, I'm not sure what the next step will be but I'm sure you will be hearing from the elders concerning that. I've been preaching over the last several Sundays on a healthy church and I talked about the statement out of Rick Warren's book in the Purpose Driven Church about uh, you know the issue is not church growth but it is church health and if you get a church healthy just like the physical body it will grow. And last week I talked to you about some of the characteristics of a healthy church being one that there is the consistent uncompromised teaching and preaching of the Word of God. And I spent most of my time on that point last week. And uh, I came down, I also talked though that uh, how that a healthy church will have impacting worship. You know, and worship that when we come together and we leave this place, we know God's been in the house. We have experienced His presence and His power and His blessing. And we go encouraged and strengthened and challenged and lifted up. Well, this morning I want to continue to preach on the theme of a healthy church. And as you see in your bulletin possibly, or I don't know if that was announced in there, but Anyway, today we're going to be looking at the subject of a healthy church will have a passion for the unsaved. A healthy church will have a passion for the unsaved. And you say, well, what does that mean, Daryl? What does that look like? You know, I, uh, I am the third generation in the Allen family to have been called into ministry and ordained in the church of God. Megan is the fourth generation, very proud of that. But, uh, you know, down through the years, when I was a kid, uh, my granddaddy Alan died when he was 56 years old. He died prematurely, very young. He died about a year before I was born. But my granny Alan and my granddaddy Alan had a lot of friends in ministry. And from time to time, those friends in their ministry would stop by our house my granny lived with us, and so they would stop by to see her, to visit, to pray with her, and have her pray with them, to talk over things, just, just to have fellowship, good time, what have you. I remember as a kid, man, people would come, and they would be sitting around the living room talking. I'd be on the floor playing, doing something, and I'll never forget, they always had to get down and pray before they departed and went their way. I thought that was kind of neat and special. We don't do that anymore, but maybe we should. But I'll never forget this one particular couple that was a friend of my grandmother's. Uh, he was a Church of God preacher. He was a bivocational pastor. He worked part-time at Sears in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and then he pastored churches in that general area. And he and his wife had uh, two children. They had a son and they had a daughter. And like parents do, they raised them in church. They raised them and they taught them that this is the way you should live this is the pathway you should go in. This is the way of life that you should live. But you know, as you raise your children, you can teach them the right way. You can point them in the right way. You can tell them this is what you should do and this is the way you should go in. But when they come of age, they're going to make their own choices and they're going to make their own decisions no matter what. And their son became a prodigal. Their son decided that he didn't want the God that his mother and dad had served. He didn't want to live the life that they had lived. He didn't want to go the way that they had gone or do the things that they had done. And he told him as much. And so he left and he went on his own way. Well, he was gone for long periods of time. Long periods of times, his mom and dad wouldn't hear from him at all. And, but even though he was out of sight and away from home, he was definitely not out of mind. He was definitely not out of focus or off the heart of his mother and his dad. The practice of this ministry family, brother and sister Madron, 
Every morning they would have their prayer time together and read scripture together before he would go to work. And oftentimes while they would pray about many things, one of the primary things that they would pray for, they would pray for their son, that God would some way, somehow bring him back to Christ. That God would send people across his pathway to be a witness to him. That the Lord would deal with his heart and bring conviction upon his soul. And in, in the evenings before they would retire for the night and go to bed, they again would have a time of prayer together. Oftentimes kneeling at the couch or the sofa in their living room. And Sister Madrin related the story how that she carried an extremely heavy burden for her son. I guess it's one of those mother things, mom and son's things. But there were many nights she, as she shared this story, she said that, that, that she and, and Brother Madrin would go to bed and, you know, and she would be laying there and she would have her son on her heart and she would begin to twist and turn and she would begin to weep and cry for her son. Sometimes she would drift on off to sleep eventually, but then sometimes the burden would be so heavy, the concern would be so strong that she would get up and she would get, go back into the living room and she would get down on her knees at her couch and there she would pray. Sometimes she would pray for an hour, sometimes a little longer. There were nights that she prayed that she said until she would be on her knees so long that her, her legs would go to sleep underneath her because of the circulation being cut off. She said there were nights that she would get so lost in praying for this lost son that she would suddenly, you know, she would look up and all of a sudden the, the, the light would be coming in around the draperies and the curtains of the house and she would realize that she had prayed the night through for her son and the sun was coming up. She carried an extremely heavy burden for this son. And each morning they would pray, each night they would pray. She went through a period of time though over a couple of weeks where she just was so intensely concerned and so intensely burdened for her son. She didn't know why but, but the burden was heavy and the concern was great and he was heavy upon her heart. And one night she shared how that the time came for her and Brother Madrin to go to bed. And as they had their prayer time at the couch and he got, you know, they got ready, she told her husband, she said, Euless, you might as well go on to bed without me tonight, she said, because I know I'll be right back out here in just a few moments. She said, you go on to bed, I'll be on after a while. She said on this particular night, she got back down on her knees and there she began to pray. She began to agonize before the Lord, crying out to God for her son, praying, oh God, I don't want to see him lost. I don't want to see him, God, end up in the eternal flames of an eternal hell forever and ever. Oh God, I pray that you would just get a hold of my son's heart. Lord, I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what it will take. I don't know what needs to happen for, for you to get a hold of him. But God, I pray that, that you'll get a hold of his heart. And she said, finally, somewhere up wee hours in the morning, after many tears had been shed, after long agonizing before God in prayer, she said, I came to this point that I prayed this prayer. She prayed, dear God, would you let my son have my place in heaven? And dear God, I'll take his place in hell. You say, wait a minute, Daryl, did I hear you? I, you heard me. She said, she prayed, oh dear God, would you let my son have my place in heaven? And oh dear God, let me take his place in hell. You're talking about a burden and a passion for a son. Mom had it. You might be thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm pulling your leg today. You may be thinking that I'm just giving you some story. But no, I'm not giving you a story that I read out of an illustration book somewhere. That's a, that's a true story. But you know something? I would dare say that Sister Madrin was not the first mother or the first person that had ever become so burdened, so deeply concerned for her, for her lost child that, that she was willing to, to, to go that length. Now, obviously, it's not possible. It's not possible 
for that to happen. But wow, what a passion to even t think that or desire that or even pray that. But if you have your New Testament this morning, in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, we're going to read a prayer that the Apostle Paul recorded in writing this letter to the church at Rome. And in this letter here this morning, we're going to hear the Apostle Paul pray a very similar prayer to what this mother prayed for her son. He says in verse 1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now you say, what's he saying, preacher? He is trying to help his, his, his readers who were going to read this to hear and understand what I'm about to pray. What I'm about to say will seem almost unthinkable. It may seem impossible. But he said, I want you to know there's two witnesses, my heart, my conscience, and the Holy Spirit of God are my witnesses that I mean from the depths of my being what I'm about to say. In verse 2 he says that I have great heaviness and I have continual sorrow in my heart. Hold on to those two phrases there. We're going to come back to those in just a moment. But listen to what he says in verse 3. He said, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all and God blessed forever. Amen. Did you notice what he said there in verse 3? He said, I could wish that I myself were accursed. In other words, Paul is praying, if I knew, he was deeply concerned for, the, for his fellow Israelites. He was deeply concerned because they had rejected Jesus Christ. They had stood before Pilate on that day, and, and when the opportunity was given for them to have Christ released, they cried out to crucify him, destroy him. They utterly rejected the Messiah, the promised one, the one who came for their salvation. They had rejected him and sent him to an old rugged cross. Paul was well aware of the eternity that awaited them because of their, not only their rejection of Christ and sending him to the cross, but because of their sin. And he, he's, he's burdened for them. He's concerned for them. And he's saying, you know, he said, I would wish that I myself would be accursed, that I would be separated from Christ if I knew that that would help to bring my fellow Israelites, my brethren, my kinsmen into relationship with God to be forgiven, to miss heaven and to, and to miss hell and to make it into heaven. You see, his prayer sounds very much like mom's prayer. In which she prayed, oh dear God, would you please let my son have my place in heaven and let me take his place in hell. You know something church, I think sometimes we forget why we're here. You know as I meet with pulpit committees across the church of God here in the state of Kentucky, I remind those pulpit committees Understand something. The business of the church is eternal business. We are in the business of being the body of Christ in this present world. We are here to not only proclaim with our mouths, but through the witness of our lives, to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our business, dear friends, to be bringing people to become disciples, to become followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. We're not here to, 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 uh, to, to just take care of ourselves. 
We're not here just to gather together and have a good time and feel good. We are here and we are to be on mission with Jesus Christ. And that mission is to go and make disciples. But dear friend, one reason that the Great Commission is not being fulfilled by the body of Christ in this present age is because we do not have a passion for the unsaved. We've lost it. You know, when I was a kid growing up, and I've been in church all my life, I've been in church of God all my life, and I'll, I'll never give as a kid growing up in the church. I can remember when it came prayer time, and they would ask for request. You know, in this day and time, requests primarily center around sickness. And there's nothing wrong with praying for the sick. There's nothing wrong with praying about other needs. But I can remember as a kid when there would be moms and dads who would stand up in church. Their hearts were broken. Voices moved with emotion. Tears streaming down their face. And they would ask the church, Oh, church, would you please pray for my son or for my daughter? Would you pray for my son-in-law or my daughter-in-law? Would you pray for my grandchildren? They're lost and they need to be saved. Pray that God will bring conviction on them. Pray that they will reach the point to where they cannot eat or sleep or they cannot find any peace or rest. Pray that they will become so miserable because of the convicting power of God upon their lives until they finally surrender and give their lives to Jesus Christ. There was no shame in standing up and asking for that. And the people would pray. And oh, how wonderful and what days of celebration and of joy and shouting and glory it was when God answered those prayers. Those sons and daughters would step out of those pews and make their way to an altar of prayer and give their life to Jesus Christ. Those grandchildren would come. Those spouses would come. I mean, it, it, it was wonderful to see God answering those prayers and, and people coming to Christ. But you know the reason they were coming? It was because somebody had a passion for their lost soul. Because somebody was willing to pray and intercede before God on their behalf. And not let them go. They had a passion. What does a passion look like? What, is, what are you talking about, Daryl? Passion. Paul describes it for us here in two word pictures in verse number 2 of Romans 9. He first of all says, I have great heaviness. Now I'm not Bill K, but I do know a little Greek. The Greek word for great heaviness there is angina pectoris. Brother Bill Kay can tell us more about that angina pectoris now after he has episodes for the last three weeks. If you haven't seen on Facebook this week, but his son David also, he almost had a heart attack and had to have two stents put in his heart this week. I grew up in a home where my dad was, had heart disease. My dad in his years of life, they cracked his chest three times and did bypass surgery on him. I remember my dad carried around with him a little brown bottle of pills. And sometimes when he would start feeling that pressure in his chest and that pain in his chest, Jim, you got your bottle with you? <laughs> Jim's got his bottle. And, and I mean, when, when, you know, I've seen people having angina attacks. The look on their face is one of terror. And, and I've seen them break out in big old beads of sweat. And I mean, all the blood just drains out of their face too because the pain, from what I understand, is so intense. It is almost indescribable. I've asked people who have had angina attacks, what are you thinking when that's going on? They're thinking, I'm ready to die or I'm ready to live. I don't care which way I go. I just want relief from the pain that I'm having. It's an intense pain. That hurts. Paul's trying to get us to see and understand that as he thinks about his fellow Israelites, 
his brethren, his kinsmen, if you will. And he thinks about their lost condition and he thinks about the eternity to which they are headed. His heart aches for them. His heart hurts for them. He is deeply concerned because they are lost, separated from God, headed to an eternity of eternal destruction. And his heart aches for them. You know, I read the life of Paul in the scriptures and what an amazing man. Four missionary journeys. Man lived through shipwreck, snake bite, beaten with rods, put in prison. I mean, it was amazing all that Paul went through. And sometimes you wondered, why did he do it? (laughs) Why kept him going? What motivated him? Dear friend, it was that aching in his heart for those who did not know Christ as Savior. It was the, it was the Anchina Pactoris. It was the great heaviness that he carried with him. And not only was it the heart pain that caused him to do that, but also he says, I also have continual sorrow. I'll come back to that word continual for just a moment. But the sorrow that that Paul is talking about here is, is, a, is the kind of sorrow that, that a person grieves. When a spouse loses a longtime spouse, you know, there, 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 is, there is grief that happens that is almost uh, inexplainable. Several years ago as I pastored over in Danville, Kentucky, I became close friends with brother and sister Lear. Brother and Sister Lear attended, attended the Allen Springs Church of God outside of Danville. I pastored First Church on Harrodsburg Road. And I had become kind of close with them, friends with them, what have you. And I'll never forget, it was on like, one morning my phone rang at the house. It was like a Monday, I think, or Tuesday, something like that. And their son, Donald, who I was good friends with, Donald called me and he said, Brother Allen. I said, Donald, how you doing? He said, well, he said, I got some bad news. He said, Mom and dad were in a wreck yesterday on the south side of Danville. They were coming into the south side of Danville, and he said, Dad ran that four-lane interchange. He said, I don't know if he didn't see the light or what, but he said he made it through the eastbound side fine, but as he crossed into the westbound lane, he said a car hit them, much I imagine like I got hit a couple of weeks ago on the passenger side. And he said, Mom is in the UK hospital, said she's broken up, said they're not sure if she's going to live. And he said, I figured you might want to know. He said, if you up that way, you may want to stop in and see her. I said, hold on, I'll make a special trip to go see her. I'll never forget, I walked into the, to the ICU there at UK hospital and, oh, my sister Lear, man, they had all kinds of contraptions, you know, how people are when they're broken, their pelvic is broken, her neck was broken, man, IVs, machines, I mean, all kinds of things. She was unconscious. But I'll never forget as I stood by her bedside and I would hold her hand and I would talk to her and I would pray. It was on Thursday or Friday morning, I can't recall, but my phone rang and it was Donald and he said, Brother Allen, he said, I just wanted to let you know about four o'clock this morning, he said, uh, Mom went on to be with the Lord. I said, Donald, I'm so sorry. He said, well, he said, would you be willing to help our pastor, Brother Drake, conduct her memorial service on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock? I said, I'd be greatly honored. 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, we gathered in the Alum Springs Church for that funeral. And I'll never forget standing on the stage as they brought Sister Lear in, followed by the family. As they came in the back door, I'll never forget that brother Lear, Donald was on one side and his other son was on the other side and they almost had to carry him down the aisle. He walked away from the accident without any injury whatsoever, but he was so deeply grieved. He was just overwhelmed with it, but they almost carried him down and he sat there on the front pew. Oh, you could tell he was so broken. Because you see, he understood that it was because of his unintentional negligence that he had caused this accident that had taken the life of his bride of many, many years. That day we laid Sister Lear to rest. Three 
weeks later. Three weeks later, on the same morning, Thursday or Friday morning, my phone rang and I answered it and it was Donald. He said, Brother Allen. I said, Donald. He said, I just wanted to let you know that about three or four o'clock this morning, Dad went on to be with the Lord. I said, Donald, what? Why, what are you talking about? I said, Dad walked away from that wreck without a, without a scratch. What do you mean he went on to be with the Lord? He said, the doctors told us that he died of a broken heart. He had grieved so hard. He had grieved so deeply that his heart was broken and he died. And you see, that's the level and the depth of grief that Paul is talking about here. He's saying, not only does my heart hurt for my people Israel, but he says, I grieve for them. I grieve for them. I, I grieve because I know what future lies ahead of them. And he said it was continual sorrow. In other words, it wasn't something that, 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 just, that just was there every once in a while. It wasn't just something that was there on Sunday or, 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 or on Wednesday. It was something that he lived with. He woke up with it in the morning. He lived with it throughout the day. He went to bed with it at night. He would awaken in the middle of the night and that would be on his heart and on his mind and he would be thinking about those things. Dear friend, that is a picture of a passion for the unsaved. It is when our hearts, when, when, when our focus becomes so much on the unsaved that our hearts ache for them, that we grieve and sorrow for them. It is something that causes a restlessness within us. It is something that call, puts us on our knees. It is something that puts us, you know, with, with being willing to, to, to go and do and, and to pray and to love and, and to do everything that we can to try to help bring them into right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a passion. Sadly to say, I don't see it in the church today. But we should have it. A healthy church should be one who has a passion to reproduce, if you will, to make disciples and to bring people to become followers of Jesus Christ. Oh, dear friend, think about it today. Would you be here this morning had it not been for somebody who had a passion for your soul? It may have been a gray-haired old grandmother. It may have been a youth leader or a Sunday school teacher. It may have been a preacher. It may have just been a friend in the church. It may have been a mom or a dad. It may have been a husband or a wife. I don't know who it was, but there was somebody who recognized that you were lost and undone before God and you were headed for an eternity in hell and it grieved them so much and it hurt their hearts so deeply that they were willing to pray, that they were willing to intercede, that they were, while other people were washing their hands of you, while other people were throwing up their hands and quitting on you, while others were saying they are, there's no use to even try anymore, there was somebody who had such a deep, passionate concern for you that they would not let you go, but they held on to the horns of the altar of Almighty God and they said, God, I'm not going to give up on them. God, I'm not going to let them go. Satan, you cannot have them. We are claiming their soul in Jesus' name. And they continue to pray, and they continue to love, and they continue to witness, and they continue to do all that they could until finally one day God gripped your heart with such strong conviction. And you finally said, I surrender, Lord. 
It may have been at the altar in the church house. It may have been by the couch in your living room. It may have been out in the barn by the hay, by a hay bale. It may have been out in the woods by a tree. It may have been sitting in your car. It may have been no telling where, but the place does not matter. The, but the fact was you came to that point that in your heart you surrendered it all and gave it to God and you cried out and you said, Oh God, forgive me a sinner and save my soul. Winchester First Church of God, I want to tell you something today. There is not a program, there is not a magic pill, there is not anything that will bring people to Christ like the church having a passion for the unsaved stirred within their hearts. If you will allow God to open your eyes to see how dirty and how terrible and the pain and the agony of people who are living in sin or of what they're going through and what they're living in. And, 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 and re, you be reminded of the fact that they don't have to continue to live in that. They don't have to continue to do that. Why? Because there's salvation there is deliverance. There's a better way found in Jesus Christ. If they will simply turn to him and give their lives to him, God can save them. He can clean them up. He can lift them out of the mire and the muck of sin. And he can, he can make their lives so much different. This morning as Amy comes to lead us in this song, People need the Lord. People need God. But they need somebody also to show them the way. The scripture says, how will they know unless they hear the gospel? How will they know unless a preacher comes? You say a preacher, a proclaimer. You say, dear friend, all of us can proclaim the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ through our words and through our deeds. And we can be used of God to help bring people into relationship with Christ to become a follower of Jesus Christ. This morning as they sing, I want to invite you down to the altar, down to the front pew to sit if you need or just to come and stay. And I want to invite you to come today and get on your face before God and begin to pray. Pray for those in your family. You know, some of you, I have people tell me all the time, Daryl, I have done everything I know to do. You know, I can't talk to my kids anymore. I can't talk to my spouse anymore. I can't talk to this one anymore because it causes problems when I try to talk to them about Jesus. Well, friend, you may, you may not could talk to them, but that does not keep you from praying for them. You need to pray. You need to pray like Brother and Sister Madron used to pray. You need to pray that God will get a hold of, of, of these people's hearts, that God will send people that they will listen to, that God will send somebody to be a witness to them. Let's stand. Would you come and pray today? Pray that God will stir a passion in your heart, renew a passion in your heart. Would you come today as we sing?